Hi, everybody. Welcome. Uh, my name is Jacob. I'll be your host this evening. I have a couple announcements before, for you before we get started. Uh, for those of you who might be new to the space, the restrooms are right outside the doors you came in, on the right. And we always urge patrons to check out um, our events brochures on the way out. The entire month of February, kids, teens, and adults. So make sure to pick one of those up on your way out. Let's see, what am I forgetting? There will be a question and answer portion. Now, we do ask that you speak into the mic because this event is being live streamed. So the folks at home wouldn't be able to hear you unless you're talking into the big scary mic. And it's not that scary, look at me. Without further ado, let's give a nice warm welcome to Hannah Burr. Hi there, good evening. Can you hear me okay? Okay, great. All right, so I'm Hannah Burr, and um, I am going to just talk a little bit before I get into any of the slides about why I'm giving this talk. Uh, the talk is a story about two overlapping lives, artist lives, me and someone that I've never met, and the place, Ann Arbor, and the people, our overlapping communities that connect us. Um, it's also gonna be a contemplation of art making and mortality and um, in some ways that those themes which uh, can be part of my, my own work are what compelled me to get involved with Janet's prints. So I'll be telling the story of how I came to archive her work. Um, I'll share about Janet and share some of her prints and um, the process of cataloging and archiving her work. Um, I will also talk more broadly about what happens to our stuff when we die? Because it's something I think about a lot, and especially what happens to um, a body of work of an artist when that body is gone. Um, so a bit about me. I am a visual artist, and I work in a lot of different media. So I'm just gonna kind of give you a little orientation around me first. Um, I work in two dimensions like Janet, and then I work in a lot of other media as well. Uh, I went to Brown University and I studied, I had a double major in visual art and religious studies. And uh, religious studies being more like philosophy as a department. And I studied printmaking there and learned some of the techniques that Janet uses. So that was one thing that also compelled me toward her work I, uh, this is some of my work here, and it's either pure abstraction or abstract landscape. And I'm kind of showing this image because it's sort of about the, the physical fact of artwork that needs storing and caring that becomes kind of a bit of a burden for, uh, for the artist or for the family of an artist, uh, as well as they're our greatest asset at the same time. This is a little bit more of my work, abstract landscape. And I also do installation projects that are more based in ideas. And when I'm working with ideas, often the ideas relate to kind of the sparkly underlayer to being alive or to conveying and helping connect people with things that are hard to pin down. I also write artist books and Coincidentally, yesterday is the published date for my fifth book, which is the one on the left here, Field Guide to Ambiguity. And it came out through Ann Arbor District Library, the Fifth Avenue Press. And I just wanna thank the library for just basically being very generous and a wonderful resource. Um, the other books here, I, the themes of my work are prayer, the chemical elements, and ambiguity at this point. So they really range, but they're about how to connect with these things that are often hard to connect to. So now I'm gonna tell you, I'll go back for just a minute. I'm gonna tell you the story about how I came to archive the work. So I moved here in 2017 when I got married to this man on the right, who's actually back there, um, Guy. And Guy is a close friend of Al Gallup and Karen, who is his wife. So 
they were cross the street neighbors for many years and now they see each other all the time. Uh, Al is a lifelong Ann Arbor resident who still bikes, he's 96 years old. He was Dean of Community High and Assistant Principal at Ann Arbor Huron and he's made us several excellent birdhouses and many fine batches of cookies when Guy comes over to watch football with him. And Karen is a metalsmith, collage artist, and has an MFA from Cranbrook, taught at metalsmithing at CCA in Detroit. And um, so Janet was Al's first wife, and together they raised two children, Annie and Alice, in Ann Arbor. So I really like these people. Um, many of them are artists, musicians, and they're also birders, and I'm a birder, so that's just a nice combination. Um, and somehow, we've managed in the seven years I've lived here to visit almost all of the children and grandchildren in their homes. These people live all over the place. They live in northern Michigan, Maine, New York State, and North Carolina. So I've been to Eli's house in North Carolina, the grandson, Janet's house uh, in New York State, Alice in uh, near Sleeping Bear Dunes, and we visited with Annie this summer. So they're great people, and I've seen this artwork in everybody's home that's usually framed, and it's just really been compelling to me. There are two Janets in the story, which gets a little confusing. So the Janet on the right, the sort of fourth to the right, is the granddaughter in this picture, and this is Janet Gallup. Uh, senior who I hadn't seen a photo of until two days ago so I've been working with her work for more than a year maybe two at this point and I've never actually seen what she looks like so Alice sent me some of her photos uh, just the other day so we visited Janet Jr. in New York State on the way to Boston a couple summers ago and she had just moved into a new place and I helped her hang her artwork, most of which was her grandmother's artwork. So we got into a conversation, and particularly this image in the background is uh, one that really compelled me. So I don't have this image to show you, but I, what I love about it and what I find so interesting is how she's using technique. So I'm going to read you uh, Janet Gallup's biography or the statement that's now on her Artist Archive website, just to give you a little bit of background on her and also about her technique as an artist. So she was a printmaker and a painter based in Michigan. She was considered one of Ann Arbor's most successful artists. She died in 1991. Her work has been exhibited extensively around Michigan, the Midwest, and the US. Uh, she was considered Michigan's leading printmaker and she uh, had more than 36 exhibitions in her career. Her prints are in extensive collections throughout the Midwest. She grew up in Detroit and raised her family in Ann Arbor, and she passed away at the age of 67 um, in 1991, the year I graduated from high school, of cancer. I'm 50, in case you get preoccupied doing the math. Um, Gallup graduated from the University of Michigan School of Art, which is now Stamps, and she was an instructor at the Michigan Guild, uh, represented at the Troy Art Gallery, the Craftsman Gallery near Traverse City, Tamarack Gallery in Omen, Omina, uh, the Ann Arbor Art Association, which I think is the Ann Arbor Art Center now. Um, she received the Annie Award. Her work is notable for its incredible technical skill, rich and complex imagery, with many layers and fine details. Now I'm reading this, I didn't write this, and I'm not an art historian, so I'm not like an expert at what I'm sharing about, but I'm just sharing what I found. Um, and I'm not an expert on Janet either, as, as you know, I just saw an image of her th for the first time. So if anybody uh, knew her and wants to correct me, or I, I, I wanna learn, and that's kind of partly why I'm giving the talk, just to see who it flushes out and what I learn. <laughs> um, so, Janet sometimes used as many as 50 separate screens in one silkscreen print. Uh, 
perfectly registering works with four deckled edges, which is a rare and challenging technique, all the way to the edge and off the edge of the print. She began with a painterly monotype to create gradients of color. So I can show you, there's a, a tiny, I don't know if you can see the tiny laser here, but the gradient from yellow to orange red in this is the monotype underneath. So she started with this kind of gradient uh, that was, it's almost like a painterly technique where you take a plate and you paint on it or roll or directly on it, put your paper down and run it through a press. That was the first layer, so that's the monotype in this. Um, let's see. She had a command of portraying light and color with matte opaque printing inks. Her work richly described people, places, and natural cycles in monotype serigraph, which is another word for silk screen, and painterly combination of these, as well as paintings. Um, there was a Janet Gallup Memorial Award um, that was awarded for decades during the print exhibition at the Ann Arbor Art Center, which showcases the diversity of printmaking techniques used by Michigan artists. And that's recently changed as the Art Center's changed, but um, she's been a real part of this community even after her death. So um, that's on the archive that I set up for her, that information about her. So I really love this particular piece. I love the color. Here you can see how there's like all of this fine detail, different greens, and she's even maybe doing a gradient from a lighter green to a darker green with two separate screens. And then she's got the shadow that's in blue here. And then she's got an opaque kind of white blue sky. And you can't see it on this, but this goes all the way to the edge. So she's done that registration process with many screens. I don't know, maybe five or six in this one. So, that's just another little detail. Uh, this is another one. So this is called Daffodil Hill. The last one was called Poppy Valley. And here you have the, you know, and again, I, I feel like a fraud likes being like, and here you have blah, 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 because I'm not an art historian and I don't really know what I'm looking at, but I've just been spending a lot of time with them. So here you've got light blue going to a light, you know, lighter gradient. All on the side, when I show you a print, um, this is the detail, although it's a little blurry on the screen. But you can see like there are two different browns. There's all these different orange yellows. There's two or three different greens in here. And she's got this way of creating mass in these that I think is really unusual. So those are some of the ones that I've loved. And this is also an example where you see the decal edge here, where she printed all the way to the edge. If this were poorly registered, then you'd get this kind of blur, like you know, if you've ever seen in a magazine where it's badly printed and it, it, it just looks like it's blurred. It's hard to get it nice and crisp like this. Um, she was using photo emulsion, photo transfer with transparencies, and for every color there was a different screen. Um, complicated technique. Um, so now I have this picture of a shed because I had this conversation with Janet, um, the namesake Janet, and she mentioned that if I was interested in this work, I should go visit the shed at her grandfather's house, at Al's house, uh, because Al has done his very best to take care of the work after her death. A lot of it is in her children's homes, as I mentioned, but. A lot of it is in this shed, this, not this exact shed, but um, inside is a set of shelves that he built, uh, wooden shelves, and then the framed work is in there. So I encountered this shed, and um, it was kind of an intense experience at first because it felt like I was staring my own mortality in the face. Uh, it was just really powerful, and he's done a great job at caring for the work, but he's kind of gotten to the point where he, he's like, okay, something needs to happen with this work. And to me, it felt like, like I, I wanted to care for it. Um, and also, something about art wants to be shared. Not every artist makes their work to be shared, but she clearly did, and it was shared widely. And it just felt like, sad to me that it was just 
sitting in a shed, also exposed to the elements, the really cold and the really hot, even though it was dry. Um, so the first thing I did was I took a lot of notes. I went out there with um, tape measure, some cleaning supplies, a folding table, and I started pulling things out, and I just wanted to know, like, what's there? I wanted to organize it. I wanted to clean it up a little bit. And um, I also got from Alice, one of her daughters, her the documents that we're familiar with as an artist. Um, so I have all these documents myself. You've got the CV on the right, on the left. You've got her uh, a statement that was used for a show. And then on the right is a price list, and I started to kind of pull these things together. I also found, as I was working, that um, I, as an artist, I've kind of worked a bunch of gig jobs, and one of them was as a framer, and part of that frame job was also delivering and installing artwork, and visiting the paper conservator and the painting uh, restorer. So, I, and at one point I worked for a museum doing a little archiving on the side, not much. So I had a little bit to bring to this, and I was curious to learn more. So uh, I asked Al if I could do something with this work, and he was all for it. Just, you know, please. You know, he would have loved if I took a truck and, like, took it all away. But I also don't, have, because I'm an artist, I have limited space myself, so I didn't do that. But he did have a tub in the attic of unframed work. And that I took just to kind of see how many additions there were. This was one of the things that came out of that initial note taking and everything was basically an archive. Um, so on the left are the titles of the series and how many uh, number, how many edition prints are in each edition the sizes, what the medium is, or what the type of print is, the inventory number. The inventory number is something that I had encountered. My uh, good friend, Stephanie, my dear, dear friend in Boston, is a printmaker, and she's also kind of specialized in archive, so she helped me as well. I would ask her questions. And this also brings in that, like, it turns out this whole talk and everything about this is really all just about relationship. And so I'm bringing that in as I show you a picture of my good friend. Um, so this document has been really useful. I refer to it, and I have one for myself. Um, and then this is ultimately what I feel one of the big successes of doing this was is that I created an online presence for her work. There, if you look up Janet Gallup now and you just type in Janet Gallup artwork, it brings you right to this, which is the artwork archive of her stuff. So that's something after this, if you wanna kind of see what's there, you can definitely um, find that. And to me that was like, so she died in 1991, the internet came out in 1995-ish, and so um, she never had a website, and now she does, and that feels really good. Also, it felt really good because like her, her kids could go like, oh, I want one of those prints, and you know, which was great, like just any interest it generates. And having another person care about your work is so, it just can be any random person, <laughs> but it's like that makes it more valuable in the world. So there's a, a strong likelihood now that there's a presence, now that I've done this, that I can say, hey, you know, University of Michigan or the hospital or whatever, I don't know if I'm gonna be doing any of that, but that other people will be more interested in taking her collection because it's been archived. That's one thing to know for the artists in the room is that if you archive your own work and then say, I'd like, I'd like to donate my work to you know, my, my, the museum associated with my college or something like that, there's so much less work for them to do and less people they have to pay if you've already archived it. So that's, that's just something I've learned over this process as well. So now I'm gonna show you some of her prints. Um, I hope they, they're, they're visible um, enough. This one is called Heartland, and 
over on the right are always going to be these details, but I don't know if you can see on the bottom is a, uh, like over here in the corner, that's a map of Ann Arbor and it's on this person's shirt. She's always got these like hidden things. So again, uh, this print is a serigraph. It doesn't have a monotype underneath it that I know of. But every color here, unless it's two colors mixing, like the purple is probably the orange and the blue mixing, um, but that's you know five or six different screens for this one. Um, this one's called Turning Point, and the other thing I thought was kind of cool was as I started to look at this, I thought, okay, we've got high-waisted cutoffs with midriff, like that's back in style, like people might want these now, like just from a superficial fashion standpoint, there's a kind of cachet for things that, you know, have a, a look and that's just something that I, I like to find homes for things. I like it when things, you know, I like to match make objects with people. And so this was very satisfying. So just a little bit more that I've noticed. This is probably Annie or um, Annie Gallup or Alice or both. I'm not sure. I'm sure they could tell me. But this here is over here on the right. It's a, a person on a path. Uh, this is an elderly woman. Uh, this is a prone man. And somebody sitting there, that might be a, a pet. I'm not quite sure of all the details, but there's a ton of detail in here. There's something going on with like a moon. Um, and again, it's really beautifully printed. So like when I went to the Detroit Art Book Fair, I brought this and I like, I put it up on the wall um, just, just so that it keeps living basically because I feel like artwork is only as alive as, as it gets to be seen and shared. Um, I'm gonna stop for a minute and also share that when I was uh, leaving Boston, well actually I'll share about that in a little bit. Let's see, so this is outside the shed. Some of what I did was I just pulled the stuff out and um, there's a little decking there. So I found it really helpful that there was stuff on the back. This is not actually the label information for this piece. This is a painting of hers and it's about four feet tall. It's pretty big. I don't know who that is. It might not be an actual person because sometimes she kind of created, created somebody for her uh, series. And this was a, I think it was a triptych of three paintings that were in the shed. Um, but this kind of label information, it's like the provenance of an artwork. And it's also here it tells, it tells us like uh, the title, you know, that sort of basic stuff. But it, without that, like when those fell off, I really don't know anything. And so it's just something to think about as an artist. Like sometimes I do this thought experiment where I think, well, if I were hit by a bus in a week, like what would someone encounter in my studio? And would there, would something get shown that I wouldn't want to get shown? Like how much control would I have over what happened? And what can I do today to care for what I've made? And because at first I thought, well, when I die, I'd like to have this money set aside so that I could hire someone who would then do that. And then I'm like, well, maybe I should just do that while I'm alive because who cares more about my work than I do? Not that we necessarily have the time or the energy, but it's a good thought experiment, kind of like writing a will to understand what would happen to your artist state basically, and what you want to have happen with it. So this is a, another piece. Um, this is in the same series. This is her grandson, Eli. And I think he actually has, has this painting now. He's, he's gonna take a bunch of her work, which is great. And this is the third called Stance. And again, I don't know if this is a real person or not, but all three of them are uh, I believe this was a triptych of some kind. I don't know what order, but I just find, I find them really beautiful. And I don't know if there's printmaking involved in that or not, if there's any kind of photo transfer, if it's just freehand. These are a couple of her paintings, and these are pretty large. I think Eli has them. 
luckily her grandson has a lot of space in his place, in his new place, so he's kind of taking it on, and, and that's a huge relief. It's great. Uh, this is a series, the Head Hand series. This is number four, Winter, and I don't really know that much about it. I haven't seen a, a statement about this series, but she's taken two different, uh, two different 18 by 24 sheets and done the like printing to the deckel edge, and then you can see how many layers of detail there are in here. This is a monotype here. I think this was just straight printed. I'm not sure and wiped away. So this is just the plate without any ink on it. And this is another from the series. I, I'm, I'm liking the fashion in this one. It looks too like the poppies from Poppy Valley. That same photo base was used here, but with totally different colors. And you've got a lot of different purples and blues and browns in it. And this one strangely looks like my mom in the uh, 90s. She had the same haircut as my mom, same kind of like look. So, and you can see some of the stuff has fallen off its hinges, it's slipped in the frame. And I have had to make decisions about like, I don't really want to open that up because then the piece is going to be more compromised, you know. I don't, I don't want to expose something that when it's in a frame is safer. It's, it's kind of in an airtight spot, unless it's like being exposed to light in a way that isn't good. Um, so here are some more pictures of Janet that I've just seen. She actually had a studio on Felch Street and it was a whole house. It was back when Ann Arbor was much more affordable and they were able to buy a small house and turn it into her studio. And um, I drive by it, I think about that. Here are a couple others, high tide. I'm not really sure what's going on in this one. I think this is all one woman here. And there you can see it has, it has feminist overtones to me. And then this one, uh, curtain, I just, the, the transparency and the light and the mo motion is very hard to do in, you know, completely flat, um, opaque inks, you know? So, and here's Water Ebb. It's, it's the second in a series. And I have some of these here that I can show you as well. And they're for sale, too. Um, this one, transparent, totally different color palette and lots of detail, like this tiny patterning. Anyway. Uh, waterfall on a really, really thin mulberry paper. And then this one, um, I don't have all of these anymore, but um, another thing that happened is the, uh, what's it called, Signal Return Press now sells these prints, which has been kind of neat, but uh, also they kind of sold through s some of them, and that makes me feel a little bit like, wait a minute, no, there aren't any, you know. So that's, it's like a, Anytime I handle the work or make any decisions about it, I ask Al, but at the same time I feel uh, like it's a very delicate thing, even giving this talk, you know? This is very close to a lot of people. She has things hidden in here as well. Um, she's got, th these are called uh, larvae, pupa, nymphs, adults, moths, these ones, and they're basically about the decay of a tulip and also the life cycle of insects. So hidden in the grasses are the various life stages of different insects. So this is Eli and Janet, the namesake Janet, in my studio. Uh, it's been really nice. This is when Eli came and took a bunch of work and uh, I, I still have like a small selection in case I do a larger show at, at the um, signal return or something like that. And now I'm just gonna stop and uh, 
see if there are any questions or comments, and then I, I have a few more things I wanna share that are like other artists uh, work on this theme of like, what happens to our stuff when we die? So, uh, any questions, comments? Yeah. Um, so oh, sorry, very formal. Come. <laughs> <laughs> stage right uh, so these large prints that are yeah. laid out on the table in your studio yeah is this an example of some of the items that her husband had like in the attic yeah it just in box like a so, plastic box or? Um, he had a bin and I think he thought this through it's a bin you know also Karen's an artist and so mm -hmm. the two of them have some experience caring for artwork but it was a it's it was a bin not quite as wide as the work so the work was not bent but it was like kind of cradled by the sides and I took it out of that and so part of what I'm doing is like figuring out what are the best materials and I'm also learning about like foxing and you know how you keep any changes in the paper from continuing or going on to another paper and stuff like that anyway is that it? Did you have more? No. I just thought that they looked reasonably in good shape, you know? Yeah. Like just being in an attic. Yeah. They I would wonder if they were in flat files or, but no, just in a box. They were in, they were in a box. They weren't like separated out. I mean, unless they already had the separations. There were a couple portfolios as well, and some of her drawings were mm -hmm. in there, but uh, luckily none of the stretched canvases had any dings, which is, very easy to happen. Um, any any other questions? I have a question. Yeah. And I've been kind of figuring out the best way to ask it. In your work archiving this and getting to know her family, and you said something along the lines of a lot of this deals with relationship. Yeah. What is your relationship like to Janet? Oh, so, I mean, I never met her. I know Al, her husband, and Karen, and I know her kids. And so really, I mean, it's a good question. When I'm, when I'm looking at her work, what I'm doing is um, I'm thinking about who she was and trying to piece it together. And I'm also thinking about how she's kind of gone before me, and I'm gonna be this one and hopefully there'll be somebody that cares about my work, you know? I think, oh, well, hopefully it'll be my sister or something. Sometimes I joke that, and I don't think this is really true, but that, you know, when I die, my husband might just like, like back a dumpster <laughs> to my studio and start throwing things in. Because, you know, he's a little more cutthroat about stuff than I am. And, you know, maybe I wanna give it all away in advance, but I, you know, she really had to face these issues and, um, and I, I, you know, I, I sort of feel her presence and also in talking with her children, I get a sense of their relationships and how she was so meaningful to them. And yeah, so it's like an echo or something. The other thing too that isn't really answering your question, but as an artist, first of all, I have to wear a billion hats if I'm gonna like try to make it as an artist career-wise. And I've got to do a bunch of stuff, and it's all about my own work. It's, you know, writing about it, it's photographing it, it's selling it, it's getting it up online, and, and showing it and making it. It's all sort of this navel-gazing process that feels important, but it's been really nice to focus on someone else's work. And I sort of set aside a couple hours a week to work on this, and that's been really, um, edifying, very different than my usual stuff. So, yeah, I recommend it. <laughs> Whatever form of that it takes, but. Um, any other questions? Okay, so um, now I'm just gonna shift gears and talk about some adjacent artists and their lives and their work that, that just feel relevant to some degree. So, Song Dong, I don't know if anybody's seen Song Dong's art. He's a Chinese artist, 
and he, sh one of his pieces is called Waste Not. And I'm trying to remember if I just remember seeing this online or if I've been to see the work. I think I've just seen it online and it made an impression, but I can't remember. Um, but this is everything that his mother owned after she passed away. So his work is showing her stuff and making these kind of pathways through it. And this is just another image of that. And again, it's just, it's just kind of about the what happens to our stuff when we die? How do we value what's in our lives? How do we make decisions about not just stuff, but, but what we value? And then some of you, this will not be new information, but this is a project of mine where I've taken the papers of people who passed away and bound them into a single book of, that you can't really read in any order and, and the pages are all you know, in different directions. So it's just fragments of their marks and the things that they were thinking about or the papers that they kept, it, through the papers that they kept. Um, and I'm creating a little memorial library. And I'm even thinking about, well, what happens to this when I die? So I'm kind of like, maybe the John Hay Rarebrooks Library at Brown will want it because I took a class there and you know we gave them a book each from that class. So. Not like I'm that organized about it, but it's kind of nice to think about. And also it feels like the more I care about something like this, the more I kind of treat it professionally, the more other people will treat it that way. So it's, it's a mindset too, which can be very hard to maintain as an artist, I find. So when I left Boston, I, it sort of felt like I was I was leaving everything I knew. I had been in Boston for over 40 years and I had a, a nice community and I also had a lot of artwork. And so I decided to do a project called Dispersal where I separated the work that I was currently making or had just finished that I was still working with, my favorite pieces, the stuff that felt really sort of emblematic of, of what I wanted people to know about my work. And then there was everything else, and I decided to put it all on a wall, and I made a list of the people that had supported my career in one way or another, and I invited them each to come and pick a piece, and it was just kind of whoever made the appointment before anybody else, and it was one person at a time, and it was really a rich process. And the reason I did this is because, oh, and I also made this document of them uh, with their work, and you can see from people's expression, like what a feel good project it was. It just was a lot of love and generosity. And I learned a lot about my work by doing that. I felt like I was selling it. Like when people left my studio, it felt like they had just written me a check because I was so happy that they had connected with something and that it was going to a good home. And I have a friend who was part of that project. My friend Andrew runs a gallery in Boston and he is also an art appraiser. And I had him over and I was kind of like, I wanted validation, I wanted him to tell me how I was doing in my career. And uh, he had a lot of wisdom about it. He said, uh, well, you know, are you, are you getting into your studio? Are you engaging with your work? Uh, then you're successful because that's really hard to do. And it's not that we can always do it. We can't always be up and, you know, going, but that was interesting, and then he also shared that, I mean, he said something that was a little cynical. He's like, don't wait for MoMA to give you your retrospective. Like, you know, and that's true. Like, we, we all want to be, like, discovered, and not, I don't know if everyone wants that, but fame, you know, it's this thing that's sort of dangled in front of us in this country. And so he was basically sharing what he's seen when people call him to find out the value of an artwork. It's usually the child of somebody who who bought a work that they loved it and it was on their wall, but then they died and their kids have it and they're trying to figure out if they can sell it. Half the time it's just in a folder, it never got framed, or it's been damaged in the basement or in the attic. And that's the fate of a lot of work. And so it's kind of like, like strike while the iron is hot, meaning celebrate it now, even if it's not with anybody's permission, find a way to share it or just to love it and to 
circulate it if you want to circulate it, um, rather than wait. Um, I mean, and I will share a few other stories. So these are about artists that became famous after they died. Um, having never showed their work, Henry Darger, I think he was a custodian for a church or something like that. I might have that wrong. And he never showed his work that I know of. And when he died, his landlords opened up his studio or his, his place of dwelling and all of these drawings were in there and this very complex, intricate kind of, um, these are like child armies. They're all like running around naked. Some of the girls have penises. It's a very like fascinating kind of militarized world of 1950s children running around and no one had seen them. He also had a habit of, um, of tracking every time the weatherman was wrong, like he had a log of all of the times that the weatherman was off. So he just like lived in his own world and did this thing. And now he's really, uh, he's really well known. There's been a documentary, there's been catalogs of his work. Here are a couple other images of this beautiful color. And, and then the other is Vivian Meyer who, uh, was a nanny outside of New York, I think, in Connecticut. And I think it seems like she she probably was interested, I'm somewhat making this up again, not an art historian, but uh, after she died, uh, I don't think she showed her work at all. She wasn't a known artist, a known photographer, but her work was sold at auction and, from a storage lot. And the people who bought it happened to you know, land this amazing find, which could have just ended up in a dumpster. It could have just ended up gone. Uh, so she's now considered to be uh, one of the foremost street photographers of her day, kind of showing the side of 1950s New York that I had never seen and many people hadn't. So now she's had these major shows all past, you know, never, never in her lifetime. So. I don't know exactly why I'm sharing this, except that this is a rare story of, of, of what we'd love to have happen. Maybe not, maybe she would have, maybe she was very embittered by never showing her work. I imagine I would be to not ever, to know, you know, maybe she knew her work was great, but it never, she never got that kind of reflection back while she was alive, which to me is kind of heartbreaking. So basically, my takeaways from this, and I guess why I want to do this talk, is to care for your work and share it while you're alive in whatever form. You know, it doesn't have to be some traditional way, but whatever form inspires you. Um, and that this makes it easy for others to care for it when you're gone. Um, in general, death shows me what's important and that it's all about the people. So, uh, like, this is, you know, a kind of random urge I had to do this, but I was a little bit like, I don't know if I want to really get involved with any of this. Um, but it's been really a gift and I, I backed off a little from like I wanted to have a show here and then I was like, you know what, maybe like just, just give a talk, you know, I have to pace myself and not do too much. But it's been really a wonderful thing and I have learned a lot. Um, so I'll just leave you with this quote by Yuri Kochiyama, who was an American activist, and still is, I believe. The precious intangible gems, like happiness, satisfaction, self-respect, and pride, they are thanks to the people who come into your life. Life is not what you alone make it. Life is the input of everyone who touched your life and every experience that entered it. We are all part of one another. So that's it. Thank you for coming. And then um, if you have any more questions or comments, uh, I'd love to hear them. They're very organized here. Uh, talk in the mic. I saw that she passed relatively young, and I was just curious. Um, I don't, you know, need to know personal details or anything, but I was curious if her death was something like from an illness where it was somewhat expected, or was it more sudden? 
which would bring me to the question of if she knew she was passing, had she done any preparation of any of the work on her own behalf? Well, the answer is that I don't know most of that. Uh, what I do know is that she worked on a piece um, called From the Porch um, that was a very complex piece, and it was from the porch that she was looking out of, uh, which is still where Karen and Al live today, is where we often visit with them, is where she was. And so I kind of recognize, and it, it, it had, you know, Al walking away, um, in, or walking in the yard, it's kind of his silhouette. Uh, he, Al's silhouette is in a bunch of her pieces, like snuck in in interesting ways. Um, so it was definitely not totally sudden thing. It was, uh, it, it, my guess is, and I'm not sure that it was a diagnosis that maybe was kind of a, a pretty intense onslaught, um, a cancer diagnosis, but I don't know. Um, yeah, any other questions? <laughs> Just waving the mic, yeah. Um, do you happen to know if, uh, I hear the name Gallup and I think of Gallup Park. Oh yeah. Is there a story there or is it? There is, so Eli Gallup is the grandson's name and Eli Gallup's great grandfather was the founder of many parks here. Uh, and Al, who's now 96, is one of the oldest living residents of Ann Arbor. Uh, guy always likes to say, Al never tells a story twice. He's always got a new story. And a lot of them are about how there didn't used to be dumps here, and people used to just back their trucks, trucks into the ravine and you know drop their mattresses and various things. And so he gives a great perspective on this place. And uh, it's cool, like we went to dinner at the Gandhi Dancer, uh, which was, his train station for many years. And I'm sure a lot of you have a, a deeper memory of this place than I do, because I've only been here seven years, but it's really interesting, all of the layers and, you know, the layers of, of people and the layers of buildings and architecture. I could stare at those history books for a long time that have photos of, you know, the street corners that we, we, we pass all the time when they were just dirt roads, yeah. Um, I have brought some of the prints, and I brought some of my books, just in case anybody wanted to look at those. And uh, the prints are for sale. I can tell you the prices if you're interested. The uh, proceeds go to the archiving process of her work, so uh, which includes that artwork archive has like a monthly fee, to, so that needs to kind of be kept in perpetuity. Although one cool thing about our artwork archive is if you stop paying the fee, it's just sort of frozen in place. So your stuff can stay there. There's just no uploading or downloading from it or using any of the other features. But I believe your work will still be there even if no one's paying, which is kind of cool. So, yeah. Well, thank you very much, Hannah. Thank you.